So, last but not least, we're gonna talk about the types of requirements. We briefly covered them already in the first lecture, but now we're gonna go a little bit into detail. So first of all, what's the motivation to consider different types of requirements? Different types must be documented for a complete requirements documentation. And these required types differ with respect to adequate specification techniques and also their importance for different types of your system. So already for those reasons, it makes sense to also consider like different types of requirements. We separated the requirements into three major types. First, functional requirements. Second, quality requirements, which are also called non-functional requirements and constraints. I also briefly teasered the fact that functional requirements are often documented using three perspectives, data perspective, functional perspective, and behavioral perspective. We're gonna look now a little bit closer into those, starting with the data perspective. All systems need to deal with data, especially in computer science, and data can have or take different forms, like data on customers, articles, and other stuff. It could also be different types, like multimedia, videos, songs, text documents, and so on. And those information must be adequately structured and represented. So you need to answer questions like which information or data items are relevant to the system, which are irrelevant, which information or data items are at the boundary of the system. And there are different ways to represent those pieces of information. You could use UML class diagrams that you know from your computer science 101 courses, context diagrams and data dictionaries. It makes sense to note that the data specified in the requirements need not be directly related to the implementation. Same information, but different data structures is possible. For example, the attributes versus classes may change strongly. Here we're strictly talking about the elicitation of requirements. In the information system, understanding the data is a key driver for what you're supposed to build, but also for the usability. So we're not going too much into detail with the explicit example. Those are more for illustrative purposes here. So if you look at a bookshop UML example, you get the idea where different data perspective aspects come into play, but you already know how UML like data or diagrams work. So we just move ahead and briefly scratch the surface on context diagrams examples where you have in the middle a larger like requirement piece which is like manage courses and customers so something that you want from a functional perspective and then there are different context parameters that have an influence on this functionality that you would like to achieve. So what you need to manage courses and customers, you have a relationship to customers. They are in this context. You have a customer clerk, you have accounting, you have courses clerks and you have instructors. The behavioral perspective on the other end is used to describe what a system will do with the data from the data perspective. So how input information is transformed into state information and output information, how sequences of interactions of the software system with uh, environments happen, so with people, with software, or with hardware, for example. The system behavior is important, obviously on various levels. So for example, on the business process level, it describes the fundamental flows of activities in an enterprise. On the task level, it describes the interaction of people with a software system on a coarse grained level, for example, defining a new customer. And it also has a, like, defines and describes interactions like stimulus and responses. So what happens if I click that? Oh, that happened, great. And there are also, similar to the data perspective, different specification techniques for the behavioral perspective. Um, often used are textual use cases, so you're writing it, business process modeling languages, but also scenario-based modeling approaches or event-based modeling approaches. So pretty much what I just said, I click that, what event happens after I click that? The techniques can be categorized along the following dimensions, like data flow versus stimulus response, or complete description versus a prototypical description. We'll get back in detail into those like uh, categorizations later when we talk about the elicitation and documentation phases of requirements engineering. Once again, UML has something for, be, for your requirements uh, process. If you would like to, or if you're looking at the behavioral perspective, you can use 
uh, use case diagrams, but also state machine diagrams, activity diagrams, also knowledge that we expect you to have from your CS101 course. Besides those perspectives, there is also another type of requirements that is relevant for functional requirements, and those are the interface requirements. Remember that in the previous topics, we talked about interfaces between different, uh, between system and system context, and you, you somehow need also requirements for them. There are different types of interfaces, mainly user interfaces, software interfaces, and hardware related interfaces. And those interfaces must be properly described and you need the requirements for those. So for the user interfaces, you describe often the layout, the look and feel, the category of interfaces, the interaction sequences. If I click on that button, this happens and it looks and feels like this. Very important in the context of the usability of what you're building there is this type of interface. The software interface is, as the name suggests, the interface to other software parts and are defined based on identification of a service. So how do I find the service, the protocol that is used for those two software pieces to interact with each other, but also the data form is essentially the language that they talk to exchange pieces of information. There are like very well known standards or examples uh, that you probably use on a daily basis like web services, HTTP, HTTPS, um, but there are many, many more. Uh, please note that it's also possible that a data file is written to a specific location and read by another pro uh, program. This also is a software interface because this is how they communicate and talk to each other. And then finally, we also have to consider hardware interfaces. Hardware interfaces are a little bit special because they're often time critical, where protocol specification must include time information. They also often specify close to hardware if you think about addressing, hardware-based uh, services and identification may be given in bits and bytes, which is completely different than, I don't know, for a web interface. And other than that, usually hardware interfaces are like software faces, uh, but with some special properties. And mapping software information to physical world is done by hardware. So if you want your, hardware, your software, your thing that you build to interact with the real world, you probably need hardware. There's no other way around getting to the real world. Now that we covered the functional requirements aspects in a little more detail, let's move to the quality requirements or the non-functional requirements. Quality requirements define qualitative attributes of the whole system, a single function or a group of function, in essence, how good a system should do the things it is supposed to do. Non-functional requirements are used to encompass all kind of not functional requirements for a system. Quality requirements should be related to the functional requirements or a group. We already discussed that in the previous lecture. Development constraints should be captured separately and the project aspects should be clearly separate from product aspects. As already mentioned before, I like to use non-functional requirements because this is how I used it, but I also already stated that it is uh, not recommended to be used anymore. Usually you talk about quality requirements now, um, but a lot of people are still very familiar with the term non-functional requirements. If we now take a slightly different perspective on how to uh, categorize uh, requirements or how to find different types of requirements, you can, uh, in addition to the data perspective, the behavioral perspective and the functional perspective for the functional requirements, you can also build something similar for the non-functional or quality requirements. We can split it into functional attributes and development attributes like maintainability, portability, and then the functional attributes further into local attributes and non-local attributes, namely performance and liability or security and usability, but there are more. Those are just like examples to give you an idea. There is a very large catalog and a large collection of quality requirements. Um, they describe the product quality and there are standards like ISO or DEANS for those and there you find examples or like not examples, a description of those quality requirements. You can also of course consult to check if any of those should also apply 
to the project where you are right now eliciting requirements for. So there are uh, various categories with subcategories, um, some of them listed here, uh, like functionality, reliability, and usability, each with those subcategories. It doesn't make a lot of sense to just read them out loud to you now, so we're gonna skim over them. We want you to know where to find those information that this exists when you need it in reality. So besides the three main categories that we already listed here, there are also furthers like efficiency, changeability, portability, and many, many more. Uh, let's take the example of performance and look at it from different levels of the system that we're talking about here, or let the, the, that you could be developing. So from the user level, we could uh, think about performance in such a way that the user can create an account with only two interactions. So maybe username and clicking register or sign up. Um, what does this look like from the system level now? Um, if you think about performance from a system level perspective, the creation of an account, pressing of the uh, system availability button takes a maximum of half a second. Those non-functional requirements are derived uh, from the results from the interplay between both levels. So you get various requirements here. What did we learn in lecture number two? First, we looked at the system, the system context, and the irrelevant environment. And we discussed and talked about what separates the system from the system context, and what, which is the system boundary, and which separates the system context from the irrelevant environment, which is the context environment. The system context defines what is relevant for the system and what can be ignored tells you something about stakeholders, data sources and things, standards and many more aspects. The system boundary defines the scope of the system, which functionalities are provided by the system in comparison to what is provided by the system context. A wrong system context leads to erroneous requirements, which is possibly fatal for your project. We also discussed the existence of gray zones in the system boundary, which should be resolved by the end of the requirements process. And we also talked about a gray zone in the context boundary, which should be kept as minimal as possible, but in contrast to the system boundary, might not be completely gone at the end of the requirements engineering process. Finally, we also briefly talked about more details on the types of requirements and extended our knowledge in that direction a little bit more.